uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Open Source Sustainability Panel. The motivation behind this panel is to provide some insights into the audience with, for, for the audience to regards to funding open source projects and making them more sustainable. So you might think what kind of sustainability you're thinking about. It, we're not going to talk about climate change or the environment, which is also an important topic. Uh, we're going to talk about more about burnout and funding and making sure that projects are set up for success and uh, long-term success at that. Um, we're also going to talk about community interactions. Uh, so it's not just about uh, the money part. And yeah, that's, we're going to do the first like a, a couple of questions and then we're gonna open the microphone for the audience. We have one microphone over there. If you want to ask a question, please line up uh, and we'll be happy to take the questions. We have five panelists today. Uh, I'm gonna do a short introduction now. So we have, starting from the left, we have Deb, the executive director of the Python Center Foundation. Round of applause, please. <laughs> then we have Charles, a community organizer and the vice president of the uh, Django Software Foundation. <laughs> then we have Anwesha, uh, the Pi Lady and the community organizer as well, also working for Red Hat. And um, round of applause. <laughs> then we have Armin Ronaher from Sentry among other things. <laughs> and at the end, last but not least, we have Samuel Colvin from Pydantic. <laughs> okay, so let's start with the first question, uh, which is, how would you define the sustainability and what's the most effective thing you've seen for setting the project up for the long-term success? And for this particular question, could you please everyone Starting from yes, and then yes. maybe we'll go the other way. The other time. Maybe, maybe, yes, maybe. All right, yes, all right. It's the starting from that. Um, so I think one of the most important things for setting a project up for long-term success is uh, doing the work to figure out what you want to get done there before you kind of open the doors. So if you have a goal in mind, then you attract the people that want to help you with that goal. So I think it's really important to do a little bit of like strategic planning and thinking about the future. And then uh, just kind of as a side note, if you're picturing your project as um, diverse, uh, don't put that off, you should start at the beginning because it's really hard to add it back later on. Okay, I'm going to answer from a different perspective. Uh, so uh, my approach uh, will be from the community side uh, and like sustainability uh, of the like peoples and projects uh, health. Um, and maybe uh, yeah, since we are talking about community, I'm going to give an example of uh, a group of younger girls workshops that uh, I uh, help organize over the three years, like in total kind of 20. Uh, this the location is Turkey. So like, um, what was the success uh, that a group of us come together and managed to reach so many uh, women uh, over the years successfully is I think like uh, we, we built a good like uh, core organizers community which uh, is equivalent of like what we have as maintainers in uh, in Django uh, or in open other open source uh, projects and like the uh, collaborative working of that group so even though one of us were burn out and couldn't continue, the work was going on and as a group we were able to uh, relay, like, relay the knowledge, message, expertise over the years and like successfully managed to run it. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, <coughs> a sustainable uh, open source project to me is a project which is adaptable um, and which can change. It's not rigid in its administrative ways. When I'm saying administrative, it is code uh, um, and also the new changes in technology and also legal uh, for the matter of fact, and, uh, but without changing its basic structure. And 
uh, and on the other hand, uh, not exhausting its um, uh, its uh, base. Uh, not uh, when I'm saying not exhausting uh, what it has, I'm actually talking about the community. These things, when you're starting a project, seen the most uh, small things initially. But these are the things, trust me, it is going to be the biggest ones in future. Initially, uh, we all are technologists. We are just too excited uh, about the code. Like, whatever is um, the problem, let's do a website and it's going to solve everything. No, it's not. So, think about the small things how to deal with the community, how to maintain a behavior and set a tone of the community. So that is what uh, a sustainable open source project looks like to me. Um, <clears throat> so I will wear two hats here today. Um, so hat number one is I build a lot of open source libraries myself, usually not really commercialized. So that's hat number one. And then hat number two is we're I was sort of representing Sentry here, which is a company that um, has what I would still consider a very strong open source core, and um, our main product is also open source, but it is also open source with NASCARS. We can go into this later. Um, but it is a very capitalistic business with uh, venture capital and, and everything that comes with it. And both of those things have to be sustainable, right? If you want to make an open source company, then there are certain rules, but if you want to have your own open source project, uh, there are certain rules, but these things don't look anything alike. Um, for an open source project like um, Flask or any of the things that I've built, I don't know if they were ever sustainable in the sense that they are still alive, which is great, but I didn't really do a particularly good job at keeping those things alive. It was eventually became popular and then other people started maintaining them. Um, so I, I actually I don't have good suggestions on how to do community management because like I didn't ever succeed in this. But I think part of what makes these projects actually be sustainable is is, is get to the point where um, others can come in and and help out, even if the original person like me just runs away. And what helps that is was actually mentioned before, which is like clearly communicate what the what it was supposed to do. Like, maybe you didn't even finish building it in the first place, but you wrote a little document that's like, okay, vision 2030, this thing can do X, Y, Z. And if it's written down once, then that's maybe also what gets people into it. And then even if the original maintainer runs away, um, the project has a much higher chance of surviving because it was written down at one point. Um, and I think for the sustainability on the company side, it's a very different thing. It's like, there are actually a lot of these legal protections. It's figuring out, like, how do you set boundaries between the business part of it and the open source part of it. And like many different companies have done it in different ways. Um, there are red hats of the world, there's like the centuries of the world, and depending on the business, there are like very different rules, but you have to be very, very specific um, because there will be competing interests um, and you have to be transparent about them because otherwise you're going to have a very terrible relationship with the people that actually want to have the only open source part of it. Um, and so that's, I, I think, the, the second version of this. Uh, I would say there are three parts to the, the health of any open source project. There's, there's like the quality of the code, there's how fast you're moving, and there's the degree to which the project is kind of community-led or has lots of different people, people contributing, and you get to choose one, in effect. Or rather, you, it's always a trade-off between all three of those. And so the first thing is to acknowledge that and accept that there's going to be trade-offs. The faster you move, the more likely there are to be bugs. The more people you have contributing, the harder it is to maintain code standards and to move fast because someone comes along, starts a pull request, and they might finish, finish it in three months. But if you're trying to do a monthly release cycle, that becomes problematic. And so, but, but the point is, all three of those things matter to the longevity of a project. Uh, the, the code quality obviously affects it, but like, if I come and contribute and the project is excellently managed, zero bugs, but there's not going to be a release for two years, my willingness to come along and contribute another pull request is going to be reduced. So it's, I think that it's some difficult challenge of basically those three things and trading them off and accepting that you're going to not get all three of them right. You're going to have moments where you basically take over someone's pull request or close it and do it yourself, but try and do that as little as possible, except that you're going to delay the occasional release by a week to let someone finish their pull request. Yeah, working through those, the, the trade-off of those three things. 
Okay. Um, so now maybe let's move on to the topic of, uh, of related to funding. Uh, we have a diverse representation of different organizations on the, on the panel. Uh, some are for-profit entities, some are non-profit entities. Uh, what's the approach of, to funding the project? Because eventually, if you want to make it sustainable and it's not purely based on only volunteers and it's also based on, on some compensated uh, work, uh, there are many ways to, to approach this. So would you like to maybe share your thoughts on, on that approach? And maybe this time let's go from the other side, not back. So well, this time I don't get to think about my answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'm lucky, I was working on Pydantic uh, more or less on my own. I had some people helping me, but I was basically working on it full time on my own. The end of 2022, I was being paid, got some sponsorship, got some money. Salesforce, for example, gave me $10,000, which was very nice. I suppose I was getting towards being paid like $35,000, $40,000 a year to work on it, which was like beginning to be a salary, depending on where in the world you live, but like definitely wasn't the, the salary I was hoping for. And then like basically the biggest VC in the world reached out to me and said, would you like to start a company and can we fund you? I'm very lucky in that situation and now I run a for-profit company and I'm very much enjoying it. Very hard to know what, what, what I would have done the other way around. I think the first thing again is to acknowledge there are open source projects that are not for profit, that are purely community led that die and there are open source projects that are managed by big corporations and people are funded and they die too. And there are successful projects of both sorts as well. Like, Neither one is guaranteed success or guaranteed failure. You just have to work through the challenges. And I think, I mean, the one thing I would add is like, if you go and take money from a VC, you have to acknowledge what that means. That means that at some point in the reasonably, in the medium term, they want extraordinary returns. And like, they're prepared, they're, they're prepared for you to do anything to get there. And that's, that is a compromise that you, that you have to accept. And I, I, I'm enjoying it a lot, but like, you can't pretend you're going into it and that you're still running a, a charity. Yeah, so um, I very intentionally did not try to raise money for any of my open source projects. Um, mostly because, actually for what was mentioned, which is like the reason some people like the libraries and things that are built is because they are open source, no strings attached, uh, no ulterior business motive behind it. Um, and the <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it is a challenge because like eventually you, you actually realize that there are lots of large companies that use your stuff and if you're like, hey, I feel a little bit entitled to get some of this money. Um, and so um, I chose to join a company um, due to my open source work, which also did open source, but had a business model, very clear one, like make money, sell stuff. Um, and one of the things we were trying to do at Sentry is we, um, we have been funding open source dependencies for the last couple of years. So we take some of our money and we, for us it's marketing budget to some degree, but it is like giving back to the community of, of the, the people that we use. Um, so we, we go through our dependencies, we try to figure out like to which degree do we use them and then we fund them every year. Um, and we're also looking at encouraging other people of doing that. Um, but there's, there's a very clear challenge with this, which is, um, Sentry, for instance, is a, is a commercial business, right? It, it makes money, it sells the software. But then we also have open source libraries and we had many people contributing to us over the years who are basically unpaid, right? And at one point I felt really bad about this and I actually figured out it's really hard at times to pay people that don't want to be paid. Because the moment you give someone money, it also turns into like, well, now I have expectations, right? And so we, like one of uh, my reports, uh, or former reports at this point, um, has, has been very helpful in actually like sending Christmas gifts and stuff to contributors there because like they didn't want money, but that doesn't mean that they are not appreciated, right? Uh, but it is very tough to walk this line because like the moment money is involved, um, your perception of the project changes. And sometimes people are not willing to do that. Okay. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm the right person to do it, uh, like answer this question. Definitely I'm not because I am working in a project, uh, the community side. I work at Red Hat and I work uh, in the Ansible community engineering team. So I release the, uh, I, I release the free version of the stuff we sell. So uh, basically Red Hat pays me to do the community job. So Ansible has uh, a pro, um, Ansible has an automation platform which you can actually buy and Ansible has a 
uh, open source version where you can uh, uh, like you, uh, for the community version. So now, in our case, it is very predefined and preset. What in Ansible community, especially what we do, uh, we keep the definition of those two things and what you are getting if you are paying, when you are paying, we uh, try to keep that definition very clear. So that works for uh, us. But uh, but I have, again, I need to say that, that I am not the perfect person to answer the VC funding. Uh, yes, uh, previously uh, I used to work, I used to make those agreements uh, as a lawyer for VCs. So I I know the bad uh, bad clauses we used to put. Like I used to insist to put. put so yeah. Okay, I'm going to answer uh, uh, from a, a non-profit perspective uh, and give uh, uh, give the uh, details of our fellowship program. So, like uh, in Django, uh, Django Software Foundation uh, is uh, has uh, owns the intellectual property of Django, and also uh, like PSF. Uh, is responsible from uh, all the things that Student Council is responsible from, which is uh, like all the non-technical uh, decisions, directions, including fundraising, and uh, uh, since a while we run this fellowship program. So, like even though Django is a, a big open source project, and there are a lot of uh, volunteers, volunteer maintainers. Um, we have uh, two full-time employees employed by Django Software Foundation, uh, DSF fellows. Uh, so they are employed to uh, work on Django, uh, uh, and I think we can finally say code base, because a few, year, until <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago, we, <laughs> we officially uh, saying we hired them as community managers because of the US law. Uh, uh, but I think now we, uh, we can freely say we are actually uh, hiring them to work on the code base um, as maintainers. And like um, the direct effect of this is uh, thanks to them, Django uh, uh, can release a, a, a security release once a month. This is not something you can uh, easily run uh, by a, uh, in an open source project by a, a group of uh, volunteers. And uh, I think, yeah, a, a good example, uh, and I think uh, then uh, PSF actually uh, um, adapted the idea. Uh, we have Lukash, uh, the first PSF, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, fellow. Uh, so, like, it looks like this this is working uh, uh, as it's proved itself for Django and uh, it's also proving itself for uh, Python. Yeah. yeah so, um, so for small projects, like I, I've been part of a couple of different nonprofits that have helped small projects get started, and the first advice I give them is that the amount of money going out should be less than the amount coming in. So that's important. You should not spend money you don't have. Um, but more seriously speaking, like you need a budget and you need to decide what you want to do. And then if you want to create a sustainable relationship with funders, like for something at the PSF or any kind of nonprofit or community run project, what you need is transparency, like you need to really be honest with those funders about what you're doing, what's on your roadmap, what you're planning to do in the next couple of years so that they understand where you're going and then making sure that you continue to have alignment with those funders. Because a sustainable relationship with a funder where you have told them a bunch of stuff you think they want to hear so that you can get a check this year is not going to be all that happy when they find out that you've been telling the community something totally different about what your roadmap is and what your plan is for the code base. So sustainable funding relationships have like honesty, transparency, and alignment at the heart of them. Yeah. Deb, you mentioned a, a roadmap um, that you need to share with the with the potential founders and and hmm. uh, you need to essentially have a plan of, of where you want to go as a project now 
when you start the, the 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 fundraising, obviously the the founders, the donors, and the community might have divergent interests. Or in case of a company, the company might have a different business interest than the community uh, around the the product. How do you manage the the two of those? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, like competing interests, but the like so the alignment might not be a circle, it might be a Venn diagram with a big chunk in the middle. Like, certainly I've been at conferences where it's like, oh, now we're reading the lengthy list of sponsors again for the 19th time today. And you can see the audience is like, ah, yeah. Is that alignment? Not exactly. But I think people understand that's like a, a necessary part of thanking sponsors for the work. Um, when you get into technical decisions, I don't think you can, uh, I don't think you can tell one group one thing and the other group another. Um, this is not going to work. It, it might work for one year of funding. Um, but it's, uh, I, th I think that it's, uh, like, people need to, uh, if they don't understand why they feel like uh, there's misalignment, then usually it's like a matter of doing some education. Um, so for instance, the PSF is a US nonprofit. We have some weird rules that are arcane to IRS code in the US, uh, things we can and can't do. And sometimes like people are a little frustrated, like, like for instance, why can't you send money to Iran? Um, and it's because we're a US-based company and it's illegal for us to do that. Would we like to? Would the community like to? For sure. Um, but because of where we're based, we can't. Uh, usually, at the PSF at least, uh, if companies ask us to do something that is gonna make the community really unhappy, I tell them no thanks. Because it's not worth it. Like, our real value is the community and a company that is that wrong-handed and misunderstanding of what open source is, is not going to be a good long-term partner for us. Um, uh, so uh, for me, what, like for us in Ansible, what we do, essentially the, the basic definition and the boundaries are set, were set at the very beginning. And uh, we, the community team, act, uh, works as a liaison between the Ansible community and Red Hat. Uh, that is what we do. And since the definition and the boundary for both the project and the product has been set uh, very earlier, there, uh, our only goal is to change it or uh, la uh, like revamp it or have a look at it, the, a look at the definition time to time. So that is how we manage. So yes. Yeah, so I think this is a little bit of a loaded topic for us, and I will represent Century here now, because um, we have been, uh, I don't know if I would say accused, but I, I think that there was a quite a bit of controversy about our license change, uh, because we moved from an open source license model to what I call delayed open source, so like the first two years is an exclusivity period, and then any code older than two years is fully open source. And um, our um, head of open source, he wrote an interesting blog post about it, which is like, it is really only a rug pull if someone is standing on the rug. Um, and I think this is really interesting because um, what is the reason why you're doing open source? It actually turns out there are many different ways of going about it. From our perspective, we like all the elements of open source, in particular also being able to have a business running side by side. But there are also other people that say like, well, the, the actual definition of what it means to be an open source project is be open, very open to contributions, to be very open to forking, all of that, right? And not everybody actually shares all of those ideas. And I think one of the mistakes we sort of made uh, or we didn't realize is that our, our original motivation of building this as an open source project was actually a different one than some other people's motivation for doing an open source project. For instance, for me, for Flask, I want it to be open source that everybody can use it, no strings attached. The reason Sentry is open source is not so much to get a bunch of contributions from everybody, but to also say like, hey, you can keep using that software even if the company fails. Like if, if we go away, it's still there. It's still for someone to use. Um, do you want to use it in an environment where we can't legally serve you? You can like, you can take Sentry and run it in Iran. We can never sell you the software there for legal reasons, but you could self-run it there, right? This is absolutely okay for us. 
but you also want to have this um, this business on the side. Um, and so there are many different ways in which you can go about it. And we sort of made this mistake a little bit to um, not change anything that we felt is important to us, but where a lot of other people felt like we, we really ripped their understanding of open source apart. Um, and this is this is challenging because like you, you don't know how people respond until they actually uh, maybe change one of those boundaries, right? Like we, we had pretty clear boundaries in the beginning, turns out we interpreted them differently than other people did. And, and I think that risk will always remain. Can I ask um, how come you didn't know how the community was gonna respond? Did you not? Did you not talk to the community before? Um, so the challenge is not so much that the community, our community, responded in a specific way. Actually, our community didn't care, right? Um, but there is open source community as a whole. And oh. the open source community as a whole was very uh, frustrated with um, how can we call ourselves an open source community if we do delayed open source licensing, right? So there's, there's a lot more than, than the people around us. Like the, all the people like, that we service, everything like they, for them, that change was not, um, was not meaningful, right? Because like everything that was be possible before and possible afterwards is the same. Um, the, the thing what the license restricted is commercially operating Sentry as a cloud hosted provider. Um, and uh, but but we sort of we sort of culturally appropriated the meaning of open source in a way, um, and and I think to the to the degree to which people sort of outside of the space that we looked at had opinions about it, I think we under underestimated. I'd say uh, this is a really hard question, which is why I tried my very best to completely avoid it. And so whether or not it's the the right decision, we decided to keep Pydantic completely open and MIT licensed and go and build something that solves a completely different problem for the same people. And that was mostly because I've wanted to build Logfire for ages and I was able to kind of co-opt this company into doing that. But it also means we don't have really any of this tension. The, the main problem is that people come and say, why you, the people who do data validation, are building an observability platform? But I think we can get around that. But it, it means that for us, Pydantic is purely a way of bringing people and getting their eyeballs onto Logfire and giving them some level of conviction that we might build good software. But I think having watched Sentry, Elastic, Redis, et cetera, I'm not saying you all did exactly the same thing, but all of those companies took a lot of heat, some rightly, some less rightly. Uh, and watching that was definitely one of the reasons that we, one, one of the reasons that we went and built something different. And two, one of the reasons Logfire is not source available in any, well, the, the, the platform is not source available because I watched what happened with CodeCov, and I was like, well, if you get that much heat for making the source available, but easier not to. So I do think that like the open source community, uh, to some extent, so some of it shot itself in the foot by, by, um, by being so critical of source available licenses. I also, I got a lecture from a lawyer about how we should be doing open source. Lawyers have never given anything away for free in their life. And I find the idea of lawyers who stand to make- You have the wrong lawyers. Uh, who stand to make lots of money out of the ongoing grievances about open source, complaining that things are not uh, source available, uh, or sorry, they're not truly open source, is somewhat hypocritical. So that's why we avoided it. I, I want to say one, one thing on this one, because I, I'm very outspoken uh, on, on, on there is a world where it's like open source on one clear corner, proprietary on another corner. And I am a very, very strong believer it's better for companies to be closer to open source, but maybe not entirely open source, than to say like, well, screw everybody, we're just going to make it proprietary all along. Like I think that nobody wins from that. Um, and it's, I, I kind of hope that we can push at least the, the conversation a little bit in the direction of saying like, maybe there's a middle ground somewhere that finds most of the benefits of open source. Um, because I, I feel like there's still a world where Sentry could like fail as a company and doesn't have a future. And I would love that product to be fully available to people to use even beyond our like, uh, ability to run a successful company, right? So I, I, I never want it to be dying somewhere on a, on a hard drive, never to be seen again, and just hoping that someone eventually comes back and says like, well, it's 15 years, let's open source it, like a lot of computer games did, um, where you're, really, you're, you're, you're subject to someone doing a, a, a good service uh, years after someone stopped caring about something. Now, now it's open source, but like, until then, like nothing. Yeah, I think it, it probably highlights a lot the difference between for-profit and non-profit. Um, so, like, the PSF is community 
driven and is a nonprofit, and we consider it part of our mission to continue using a real open source license under the open source definition. Um, it would be it would be pretty freaking obnoxious for me to be like, thanks for 30 years of work, y'all. I'm gonna cash in. Um, I would rightly expect all of you to throw rotting fruit at me forever for the rest of my days. So it's not gonna happen because I don't want any rotting fruit. Um, I. I think it depends too, like if you're starting a company and like 98% of your contributions are coming from people who work for you, then you know, they're on salary, like do whatever you want with your license. Um, but I feel like if you take a lot of community contributions and then change the license, like when I look at what happened with, and this is super old, um, one laptop per child and people were really angry. like. They were like, this humanitarian cause, we're gonna give laptops to children in places where there's sparse electricity and sparse connectivity. And people put like poured hours and hours and hours and hours of unpaid work. And then they were like, just kidding, we're gonna take some Microsoft money and make it proprietary. And people were like, extremely upset. It, the project never recovered. So I, I think it depends on like how indebted to the community you feel and you know, like, that contextualizes a license change for me a lot. One of the challenges, right, you can move from open source to, towards l less open source, and there's like a lot of companies who've done that, some cynically, I don't think Century have done it cynically, but like some companies have done it definitely cynically, as in they've started off pushing its open source and then they've like mo changed the license. Uh, the other option is to start fully closed source or like source available and then move towards open source when you know your business model, and I think like, it's obviously you can't change what's happened in the past, but like with new companies or new projects, that's quite a good way of like insulating yourself from the like toxicity of stopping being open source right and, and wrong. Yeah, and it, it kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning is having a strategic plan at the beginning and to just like put a finer point on that, like whether it's a, a open source business or an, or an open source nonprofit, like having someone from legal in the room that understands what open source is and is okay with giving stuff away, if that's what you think you are gonna wanna do, having engineering and having someone who understands what your business plan or your community outreach plan is. Cause that's, in, a, in my mind, when I see companies like, whoops, like it's, oh, I, I feel like maybe legal and engineering should have gotten in the room a little earlier to understand like how this code base is gonna be used and are we relying on the community for like input and libraries and add-ons or are we like expecting like three people at some of our customers' companies to do patches every so often? It's a really different model and, and it should inform your license choice. Okay, uh, here I am actually finding myself exactly in the middle. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, I'll wear my community hat and I would, um, I would like to express what, as a community person, what I want. Uh, as a community, it is absolutely okay to shock the community, but it is not okay to surprise the community. So if any project has started by expect, uh, giving an expectation of something else, and at, at the end, not at the end, at the, at the middle, that uh, Deb has given an excellent example of one laptop per child, that how they just put it out, that, oh, we just took your labor and now we are just going to use it for our profit. So that is not acceptable. So, and also whenever uh, we are putting a license, when we are choosing a license, we are essentially choosing our boundaries. We are agreeing not only to, to those licensing terms, but essentially to follow the rules of a community, norms of a community. When you say you do open source, there is an expectation that we do follow these basic rules. There are different sorts of license. When we do, uh, when we say that we do open source, I don't say that I do uh, MIT or there's a BSD clan, there's a MIT clan, but essentially it's everything together, free and open source community. Because we share a similar kind of mindset. So when you're choosing your license, just look, and also you're making your boundaries, think about what you want to do in future. And if you want to change in future, which is fair enough, 
it's a project and it should be a community decision and it cannot be now from now we are doing it kind of it needs to be, uh, the community needs to heard and when i'm saying community it's not about only that project's community that project's community has the veto power to take a decision but when i'm saying community i'm saying the open source ecosystem open source and free software ecosystem so yes and we everyone in the community is very very opinionated so that is also a norm in the community i think Thank you all for, for the input. I can see that we already have someone lined up for the Q&A, so maybe take one question from the audience. Neil, would you like to ask a question? I think the microphone doesn't work. Yeah, no, it works. Uh, hi, uh, my question is, at what stage of a project's development would you recommend you start looking for funding? Um, so, I have some ideas about like how much time people should spend on an unpaid thing, and if you're sending 30 plus hours on an unpaid thing, you should be seeking funding. Um, I, like if there's three of you and you're spreading it out, okay, but like if you know that it's gonna grow and you know that people are gonna be spending more than a couple hours a week on it each, then you should start looking for funding. Um, I think it's also telling, like, uh, maybe you are spending just a couple hours a week on things, but there's stuff that nobody wants to do. Uh, so I was on the board of an arts organization locally, and um, we had, the, and it was everyone's an artist, like, on this board. Uh, but we're a nonprofit, so we have to file 990s and do accounting and, and understand what the IRS wants from us. So each year it'd be like, so who, like, wants to do the taxes? And we'd all, like, shoot looks at each other. Um, we should have just hired an accountant. Um, someone was like, can I do it as a art project, like with embroidery? I'm like, I don't think so. But so like, if you have things that must get done to keep your project going, that should be paid for because nobody on your volunteer team wants to do it, then you should be looking for funding. One thing I would say is like, there are projects that you know you want to carry on contributing to or that you want to keep going, but there's also there's such a thing as open source that has a fixed lifespan. You go and you do an experiment, and it doesn't need to be around in 20 years' time to be successful. But if you want to prove something is possible over a week, over a month, over six months, but then you're, you think it's reasonable to abandon that, then probably you, you don't want to get sponsorship and get people assuming that that's going to stay around until you're sure that you, you think it should stay around. So I think that's one of the things, because I've definitely built libraries that I've abandoned, and I don't think that that's always a bad thing, because it's an experiment. It might have turned into something big, but also it might have inspired someone else, and I think that's important too. Uh, I also think GitHub sponsors, for all that it's not perfect, and for all it's Microsoft, and people like to be critical of like these big organizations, it has fundamentally changed the game. Not that there are that many people who are making a complete living off GitHub sponsors, but there's a lot of us who get a like, nice meal out with our partner once a month from GitHub sponsors to say thank you to them for sucking up that we're all, you know, upstairs working all night sometimes. So I think like GitHub sponsors has made a big difference and that was definitely the first sponsorship that I had that was like more than $5, I think, kind of thing. Also, uh, I like to add like, uh, I think a good time is when uh, you are ready for, for it because like software development and fundraising or like managing uh, sponsors are two different uh, jobs. Uh, you might think you are fundraising, but if your front shop is not good enough, I don't know how much amount of work uh, put, uh, went to do that, but you're just assuming you're showcasing your project and like uh, searching for funding, but like from other side of the room, uh, they only see uh, white black window like uh, so and uh, even if you like manage to put some efforts forward and attract uh, sponsors fun uh, funders this this work uh, of like funding is continuous then you need to like uh, releasing reporting uh, and I uh, keep that communication otherwise you will have like uh, other conflicts uh, which then uh, might lead uh, 
unsustainability of your funding. Oh, I just want to say Microsoft's improved over the last 16, 17 years since that one laptop per child uh, story. I would like to build up on what uh, Charles said about building a community around the, the project and making sure that there are more people involved, there are diverse contributions and, and so on. Would you like to talk a bit more about that uh, topic? Uh, yeah, in, in our prep, prep talk, so there were like two, two different sides of the story, the financial part and we're like, yes, yes, but like what about the, like uh, health and like community uh, because like, uh, um, Probably, uh, unlike some lucky ones uh, between us, uh, we are uh, most of us are working uh, for uh, companies that's run for profit, and like you're all aware that we have roadmaps, like metrics, uh, uh, and teams, and like team performance is important, and we are putting a lot of effort into building healthy teams, and then I switch back. And uh, looking at the open source community from like uh, a small project all the way up to like uh, uh, big projects uh, like uh, Sentry, Pydentic, and like then Django, Python, like uh, how much effort like are we putting into the health of like um, the community, the group, like? The, the maintainers or contributors and the like uh, wider community. I, uh, why all those like companies, profit companies are like putting that much energy into team building and we are just abandoning uh, open source, uh, I, it's not us, but like it's, it's super valid to run an open source library, that one, on your own. Like, how, how did we create such a culture? Because like, back in the days, like, uh, for example, Linux had a like, huge uh, community. Healthy, not diverse, toxic. Yeah, we can discuss it. But like, I think, I, we, I don't know, maybe it's the GitHub, or maybe you have better answers. But like, we are like, uh, we, 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 we built this culture of we are abandoning our like, contributors. So like, that's why, my focus within like my like open source communities and DSF is around like how how we can actually make uh, I, uh, take better care of our maintainers, our leaders. Like what's it like? What goods look like? What health looks like? Because I think good and healthy is uh, more sustainable. Like that's why we are uh, looking for uh, diversity and then. Uh, I'll jump to another topic. Yesterday, the like uh, the uh, core developers of uh, Python was talking about their efforts towards diversity and some like some achievements and some frustrations. Like, what are we doing uh, wrong there? Because it's same in like in Django Software Foundation. Last two fellows left uh, like like after fi five super successful year finished their uh, contract with DSF, um, super like tired. Uh, so like, that's why I think, uh, sorry, that wasn't a suggestion, but like more of a diagnosis and maybe like, maybe we should start talking about like how we can support open source projects and big open source frameworks uh, uh, in terms of like health of the uh, contributors, ways of working, how to better like um, manage the non-technical side of the things and arm, arm yeah, and I would, and like like to, like I would like to add something to this. Um, so Sentry is about 400 people, as it's not a huge company, but it's a, I think it's probably like at least as far as my involvement in companies goes, at about as large as it went. Um, I will say I find it much easier to be a manager at a large company than it is to run a tiny open source project. And part of the reason for this is that um, I, I go in the morning into the office, it's always the same people around. Um, it's a very, like, very safe space. Like you, you can say something like it's very constrained in, like, in the place where you are. 
the biggest stress that open source actually creates that you typically don't find in, an, uh, in a company or at least you're shielded by other people from it is you don't know where your community starts or ends or where the expectations are. Right. You can release a bug that breaks CI for random people and within like 15 minutes you have like a bunch of people you have never heard about um, piling into your issue tracker. And, and, and if that gets sufficient amount of curiosity, then it will be shared on social media. And then people jump in that have absolutely no standing in this because they haven't ever used this offer, but they're happily going to pile on it. And they can tell you what a terrible human being you are because you're not replying to this fast enough. And I, quite frankly, I got incredibly burned out from Python a couple of years ago. And this was the biggest reason I, I sort of stepped away from Python for a long time is because I, I didn't feel at all happy about how the Python 2, Python 3 migration went. And I felt like, and that was probably incorrect, but I really felt I got a little bit of a heat for like having sort of like a maybe not so welcoming opinion about like how this migration went. Um, and it is, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I, I, I will definitely say that no matter how you go about open source, it is very easy to end up in in a, in, a, in a place where you really don't know how to deal with your emotions about it because like there are expectations, there are all of a sudden people you have never felt like are stepping into your space and have feelings and opinions. And I, my uh, biggest learning over the last couple of years is, and this is purely for myself, is that um, there is a huge difference between GitHub comments, Twitter, and all that sort of stuff, and then in-person conversation. Um, I, I, I I was involved in more than one controversy on Twitter where like afterwards I went into a conference and talked to a person, like we actually had really good face-to-face -face conversations, but we interpreted the worst kind of interpretation into well, each other's. person? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that is, that is like one part that I sort of definitely want to encourage people is like take advantage of conferences if you're an open source maintainer. Get to like walk up to people that you had an argument with because it's really cleansing in a way to realize that the person on the other side is not just an angry poster on, on, on GitHub issues. But that's the only thing that I know so far about dealing with this because it's really, really hard, um, like creating this healthy environment. Can I add to that? Because I, I think, um, one, yeah, it, it, is, it is really difficult. And I think the internet has sort of this flattening effect. Like, so one of the things that I noticed when I first came to Python is everyone likes to do, and then I'm like, will you blog and brag about your work and give people more insight? And they're like, oh, that sounds like Spotlight. I would rather not. Um, mostly. We have a couple exceptions. Um, but that means that like the perception of Python is that you know we're this massive like tens of thousands of people like getting like awesome Google salaries like you know thicken your skin up you're making 300k a year jerk you know and it's like no 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 this is a volunteer or someone making a nonprofit salary um, and so like I'd like to really like kind of this is like one of our challenges is to highlight like hey like you know when you know, when your landlord kicks you out, like, and you're homeless, like, maybe don't bring that same energy to, I didn't appreciate the last migration process. Like, you know, like, it, there's this, like, we're not taking anything from you. We're trying to give you something, and then the complaints are, it's a lot. It's weird. Um, anyway, yeah, one of the very first Python meetups I ever went to, I saw an 11-year-old give a talk about how we should go back to Python 2, actually. So you're not alone in the unhappiness with the migration. Uh, we have another question from the audience, and after that, we'll probably move to the closing notes because we are already running out of time. So please ask the question. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, we are all probably working in some company which is using open source uh, software, and I'd like to ask you first of all what we can do to improve funding, I mean, from our perspective, how we can uh, fight for, for any, any help for uh, open source uh, libraries. This is, this is the first thing. And second thing is how to, uh, yeah, how to make this guy uh, maintaining this small piece, uh, how to make this guy to get money uh, he deserves for, or, or she deserves for. Because right now, if somebody has a lot of stars on GitHub, it is probably kind of easy to, to get the funding, but this guy probably doesn't doesn't have uh, so many so many stars because this is a, let's say very low level 
library. So yeah, these are the two questions. I'll give two answers. The first one is you should use Logfire because it's awesome and you get to sponsor Pydantic uh, or, or support Pydantic through doing that. And then the second one is that I, I don't think we have a good solution for it. I think some of the stuff Century's been doing in like distributing money not just to the top level projects but to the dependencies is great. We should all do more of that. I think that like there's been some discussion about more of a like system of pledging to in companies to do that and, and that would be awesome. But I think it's, it's a yet to be solved problem and it's a really hard problem because fundamentally companies pay for stuff that they need to pay for to get it. And by the definition of open source, that's not the case. So it's a, it's a hard problem. Yeah, I mean, like I'm, I'm going to pitch our idea a little bit here, which is um, we're toying with this idea of like open source pledging, where the idea is you count the number of developers you have in a company and then you have a budget per developer and you give to the community and you publish what you what you pledge um, uh, as, a, as a way to encourage that all these dependencies, including these ones over there, eventually get funded. And I do want to mention this GitHub star thing because GitHub stars, NPM, download counts, all that sort of stuff, I think they're kind of dangerous in the sense that they are elevating certain projects to visibility, but they are not necessarily actually the ones that sort of really holding something. There are a lot of open source libraries that are published on an FTP server still um, that everybody is using. If you go to your car infotainment system, you will find a lot of licenses mentioned there from open source libraries that you yourself might also be using, but because it doesn't show up in you know, a packages.json or in your PyProject Toml, you will not see it because it's like a C library somewhere in the Linux kernel, right? So the, the, the amount of like this kind of like pillars that are holding up the world, a lot of it we even as developers forget that they exist because they're like, they are so ingrained in the whole thing, but there's still at the end, there's a human that still maintains this, um, that is even less visible than, than some of the projects that are on GitHub. I wanna say there's also a little bit of an issue with the sort of behavior that we um, applaud and the kinds of behavior that we maybe forget to applaud. So like, oh wow, like you've been running that library for 30 years, high five, I bet it's a total pain in the ass by now, uh, but, um, and, you know, it's like, I would rather see us be like, hey, you took on a second maintainer and passed the torch so that you can finally retire and maybe live somewhere other than Nebraska. High five. You know, it's, uh, we're not, uh, like, I think that should be awesome. It should be like, you passed it on, yes! As opposed to like, cool, you're just gonna die with that thing, amazing. Uh, so, you know, maybe that's like an introspection for us, like, you know, that doesn't really help the funding problem, but we, we talked a lot about funding already. Yeah, I also like to add a few points because I actually had a, a talk proposal on the topic, <laughs> which is rejected. Uh, not this year, not this conference, don't worry. Uh, I, I think like, appreciation like, uh, comes first. Uh, like From X, import Y, like, I think... I. Like, the first thing that we, we, we all can do, X didn't fall from a tree. It's, it's, if you're in the Python ecosystem, it's probably built by one of these lovely people or the other lovely people that cannot make it to here. So like, first of all, like realizing all the packages that you use, there are people behind it. The second thing, like, yes, appreciation. And like, uh, you can, always, always reach out or check like what type of appreciation they want because not all of them want like, uh, not once, but ready to accept the money, uh, which uh, <laughs> I learned by surprise, like we were also running a o OSS funding and there were libraries that is uh, um, suggested and selected. And when I reach out to them, like they didn't even know how to receive uh, the money. So like, I think like, uh, like that's also good because maybe they need something else. They don't need the money. I don't know. And um, again, coming back, like we all have employers. And uh, if you're here, you're probably all like incredible developers. Uh, or have different hats uh, in your companies. Like, uh, you know you depend on like that guy or like all the other 
guys that like, uh, I usually start in the interview asking these questions, but it's not enough. You need to follow up like, hey, we're using this and this and that. We pay the Circle CIB bill every month. Is it because they're not open source? Can we please like also put our appreciation in terms of money to all those other projects that are not sending us the bill? And like, you don't need to individually go for it. Like you can like, take all the other like 10 diff other developers, uh, yeah. build a gang, and uh, no, like I think it's a culture. Like, uh, look, for example, I work with Django Python, and when I'm interviewing, I'm asking like, "Do you contribute to Django? Are you a like corporate member?" Same PSF. Uh, are you asking that question? Are we all asking this question? Shall we start asking this question, please? <laughs> um, I think to summarize the whole thing. Um, I think uh, the community in general and the maintainers, everyone has a responsibility. If we need to summarize the whole conversation. But the community, it's, Im and I'm not answering the funding question. Uh, I, I was a high paid lawyer and from there, I am working my ass off to be a technologist where I don't get paid that much. I don't understand money for sure. But um, uh, like uh, having said that, uh, when we are talking about appreciation for the com like, uh, it, I think it is a duty of the community. The maintainer is actually giving you a gift if uh, you can think of something. Even if you don't like it, it has say uh, I got a gift in a uh, Christmas uh, and uh, it's a red dress and I hate red. I wanted a pink one. But I am not going to shout at the person uh, that, why did you give me a red dress? So don't do that to the maintainers. They are giving you something if you don't like. So don't bother them like uh, a thousand males in a, like one hour or something. So that is a responsibility, like behave responsibly. Also, the, the, and also there are norms which needs to be set by the project maintainers as well that this is not acceptable in a community. Uh, clear your boundaries uh, and set the boundaries correctly. Also, when Armin was saying that he, like he was completely right in saying that the people who actually look very scary um, on GitHub, they are not that scary at all. Essentially, they are very friendly when you meet in person. Because when you re read the words, the words doesn't have any emotion. Uh, you don't understand when someone is uh, showing you a thumb, whether a person is showing you a thumbs up or they are just showing that it's nothing. Like, you don't understand it. Like when Armin said that I, I, I witnessed it uh, in 2018, PyCon India, there was one uh, developer, his whole life's goal was to meet Armin once. And I have that moment recorded. Like, he was just spellbound. So. He had, like, if you go to different conferences and meet people personally, you experience that thing as well. And uh, as uh, Charles said, that it's important to show appreciation. When a maintainer, and it is valid for both the community as well as for the maintainer. So do, if, I, uh, if someone uh, pushes something which breaks your code, don't go, far, like, as a maintainer, don't go, uh, all uh, all blazed on that person. T try to understand why that person did it. And also, uh, if someone, uh, like if a maintainer did something which crashed your system, don't go all blazed. So Py uh, I used to think Python community is a washing machine where all the human being comes and uh, they become clean and they become this amazing uh, Yodas. They don't. The social norms, the regular world norms, follow in the community, Python community as well. So yeah. Thank you very much for the for the nice words at the end. And the unfortunately we run out of time, so we cannot take any more questions or we cannot uh, provide any more answers. But uh, I would like all of you to join me with thanking all, all, all our panelists uh, for uh, talking with us here today, and a round of applause for our panelists.
And thank you to Arthur for moderating and keeping us on track. Thank you, Arthur.